All right, in my midst, I do have the Vice Chancellor of Kampala International University. There's none other than Dr. Muhammad Mpeza Mihigo. He's going to be talking to us about how ready, yes, in, uh, institutions of education are ready for the full resumption of education that is in January of 2022. We are around uh, 2.5 million vaccinations that have been undertaken right here in Uganda because the full reopening of education sectors is being pegged to the vaccinations. So the fact that we've um, expedited nearly 3 million million vaccinations yet the target is 7 million how sure are we that by January of 2022 we, we should have inoculated over five or four million people in that regard to ensure a full reopening how feasible is the target government is giving itself remember the resumption of uh, post-secondary institutions was supposed to be November November 1st then the government realized mm -mm, we are not going to achieve the target let's extend to January of 2022 so even the target of 4 million vaccinations yes was also negated and they decided let's target 7 million people so how feasible is the target how ready are these educational institutions for the full resumption of education uh, uh, of the education sector that is in January of 2022 how will they be adhering to the standard operating procedures like ensuring that uh, the young learners do not acquire COVID-19 Yes, as they veer on with their education. Mr. Mpeza Mihigo is already here and ready to indulge us. A very good morning. Morning to you, Remo. How is Kampala International University? Uh, Kampala International University is really uh, okay. Indeed. And we've tried to remain, you know, mm. present, uh, basically mm. online. Indeed. And recently, as you know, His Excellency the President mm. uh, of the Republic of Uganda Indeed. allowed the return of students mm. uh, of the health sciences. So mm. we have that minimal presence uh, at the Western Campus. So how are the institutions coping with the return of these students? Their readiness to actually you know, expedite the infrastructure exp expansion and also immunization and hygiene. Absolutely. Mm. I think that's really something that uh, is important for us to be able to reopen Indeed. for the majority of the students. Mm. Uh, what has happened uh, over the past month, yeah. uh, because uh, students and staff have been away mm. uh, in their homes and um, uh, in their families, uh, good enough is that uh, the fact that uh, the, the, the government through the district uh, health officers mm. has actually been uh, encouraging people to go and do the vaccination. Mm. So we are hopeful that while the staff and the students who are in their localities, mm. they've been able to access uh, the vaccinations. Mm. Uh, one and two, and, and recently I think Johnson & Johnson was also brought in the country. Mm. So we are hoping that uh, before we resume, we'll be able to take stock and we've been given uh, specific templates mm. to capture the data mm. uh, for staff and students. And this is going to be a requirement mm. uh, before we allow them in. I understand. But then do you think uh, we shall be uh, in very good position to actually acquire the 7 million vaccinations by January of 2022? What you're seeing on the ground, does it translate into uh, targets that will be achieved by January of 2022? I, I'm, I'm really hopeful because you see the institutions of, mm -hmm. of learning, both uh, pre, uh, pre and post-secondary, yes. Uh, have got different capacities. They I have see. different uh, student and staff populations. Mm -hmm. So uh, big institutions will have to work very hard to mm -hmm. ensure that uh, their staff and students are vaccinated. The smaller ones, I mean, when, when we had a closure, we even yes. had a debate. Uh, some institutions were claiming, you know, we only have 500 to 1,000 uh, 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 students mm -hmm. and staff mm -hmm. within the, the campus. Mm -hmm. Why would we close? Because the idea of social distancing would actually be quite obvious. And, and on the other hand, on the other extreme, you have institutions that are quite large, mm. uh, quite a, a big number of students and staff. Mm. And so the mechanisms that are required for such institutions would definitely be higher. Mm. And, and then when it comes to facilities, we are so familiar to this particular traditional mode of teaching. Mm. Now that COVID is around and is not going to go anywhere for, for some time to mm. come, mm. we have to invent uh, multiple delivery channels. Mm. The, both digital and non-digital, mm. that we think uh, should be part of the, the planning uh, within the institutions of higher learning, especially. Mm. Uh, on the lower side of education, mm. uh, that is really a tall order mm. because the, the number of kids are quite many compared to the children or the population in the higher sectors of education. Is it our citizens have failed to adapt to the new normal, which is the adherence to the standard operating procedures. You know, we are not doing things like we used to before 2019 mm -hmm. or before the onset, onslaught of this COVID-19 pandemic. And we also did notice there was a slow adaptability process to the ICT or te technological advances of this world. We did have fewer education institutions that were actually inculcating ICT within their curriculum, right. meaning 
was it was it meaning it was only COVID-19 that actually forced these education institutions to actually look at ICT as a major factor that can help with continued learning? Let's talk about this slow adaptability to the uh, new advances that are coming in. I mean, I, I mean, you are absolutely mm. right. Uh, prior to the uh, the advent of the mm. COVID-19. Uh, it was like uh, uh, miraculous, it was like uh, un unforeseeable mm. for an institution to actually integrate technology for most of the institutions. Mm. And, and even the technology was just actually focusing on, you know, having computer labs yes. and, you know, internet around, mm. not I ensuring that it, it is integrated. Mm. It's a tool because mm. technology is actually a tool mm. that facilitates learning. Mm. Uh, I remember uh, in, in 2020 uh, when we were locked down. And, and I had students at Kampala International University mm. who had completed, had fulfilled all the requirements. Mm. Uh, it, it became so obvious mm. that uh, something had to be done. And so we were among the first institutions mm. that deliberately uh, uh, went online and did a virtual graduation. And, mm. and students wouldn't believe it. And the last year, uh, we, I mean, this year again, we did another virtual graduation. Mm -hmm. On 20th November, we have another. Now, that adaptability, there was a lot of resistance mm -hmm. from students, from parents. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of them were even asking, uh, will our degrees be valid? Now, that's KIU, which is really uh, a, a giant institution. Mm -hmm. Now, if you compare other universities and other institutions of learning, uh, you will find that it's, it's the call, the COVID-19 mm -hmm. call, if you wish to call it, that uh, sort of woke them up and said, look, Technology can actually mm. do this, and we we uploaded, we established a learning management system, which, which which didn't require you know, quite the, a the lot. The fact that some institutions have been able largely to conduct classes online while others were unable does that mean that we are going to be dealing with a knowledge gap between those who are poor and those who are rich, those who were able to get the gadgets and those who were unable to get the technological advancements? Do you anticipate, or are we already grappling with the oh, knowledge of gap? Of course, of course, that is really expected because, uh, for example, if you if we delivered like we did deliver. Mm online mm. uh, courses the section of the students were able to access I that see. we even also delivered exams okay but there is a there is a group of students there is a population of students mm. that require that missed out and so institutions of learning have got to have a makeup arrangement mm. and this requires that when the students are, f are on f are on campus mm. face on face on face mm. yeah, the face to face rather you are absolutely sure that this is going to work I and see. we have to take stock mm. the challenge though is uh, many of the universities and other higher education mm. institutions are not very good are not very good with their data so so you ask the question data collection. absolutely mm. so how many of the students are actually uh, missed out during the, the the period you are delivering online they don't know so 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 it's, it's a hard thing to crack mm. and so some some you know, some students will never even return to in university. fact and how many of those students who actually even had a chance to get online right rapport with issues like uh, connectivity absolutely um, in the middle of a class and then yes. the internet breaks down absolutely so, so, so there are three three factors I that see. we have to consider mm -hmm. for online delivery first of all issues of access as you have rightly said mm -hmm. what percentage of your students and actually staff because mm -hmm. some of the staff Mm -hmm. We're using yellow notes. They were just like, you know, the, the notes they've been using for ages are the notes they give even to the current students. I see. That's number one. Number two, effectiveness. How, how effective is the online delivery? Mm. Some courses are of a practical nature, mm. and so there is no way we will have 100% virtual delivery. Mm. The third, what are your monitoring uh, and evaluation mechanisms? How do you know, for example, mm. if a student is online, how do you actually measure that learning has taken place? Mm. So universities have got to become so dynamic. Mm. They have to be very focused. They have to spend money. They have to invest. In, in technology, mm. but also in the human capacity, Indeed. because the people who do, th I mean, uh, people are the drivers of this technology. Mm. And so my way of thinking at Kampala International University, and the piece of advice I give, is that we definitely need technology, mm -hmm. but can only be an integrated model. Are we just only going to wait for a full reopening, just receive these learners and just integrate back into the education system? Or do we need to counsel these learners and their instructors to reacclimatize, Dr. Mohammed? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's really, really a very big challenge. Okay. Actually, the, the, p the bigger problem mm. is not the loss of learning. I hear you. It's actually the effects of, of not being in class, mm. of being in school. Mm -hmm. And to the extent that uh, we've had some mental health issues, and okay. so institutions of higher learning should actually prepare to establish 
counseling psychology mm. uh, places yeah. uh, where staff and students can actually walk in, mm. you know, have their privacy, mm. be able to be heard Indeed. because it's, actu it's actually the issue of not missing content. Indeed. It's about having that uh, confidence and knowing that everything will be fine. We are only being slowed. Mm. So that's really a fundamental mm. issue. And we can actually benchmark. We, we uh, for example, at the university, mm. we have got a full department of counseling mm. psych applied psychology where we have a lab. Mm. You know, some of these uh, students have become mothers. I hear Others you. have become fathers. Mm. Now, how do they juggle mm. between uh, their new roles and uh, filling the gaps that, you know, have been created by their absence mm. in class? Mm. Now, if you look at the lower levels of education, mm. it's yeah. even worse yeah. because the foundational skills are actually earned in the lower years mm. of education. Indeed. They've been away. They are now used to a new environment in the villages or in the Chabon urban centers. Mm. Absolutely. So, and these are, these are the students mm. who also did exams. Mm. And, and we are even asking ourselves a fundamental question. Mm. Is it going to be the same? Indeed. And, and that's really... So th those are some of the challenges that might be for the learners as we actually anticipate the full resumption of classes. Yes. That is in January of 2022. But what about their instructors, the lecturers, and so forth? What, the lecturers are we being, what is being done to realign them? They, they the have, for them, they even have a bigger problem. It's bigger, First it's of all, they, they, mm. they've, lost, they've lost income. Mm. They've not been paid. Indeed. If you do a survey, you'll find many universities yes. and other tertiary institutions mm. haven't actually been fulfilling the actual payments to the staff, which mm. is understandable mm. because uh, the most of these educations, mm. institutions, have actually been relying over 90% mm. on tuition. Indeed. The students are not in class, therefore they can't pay. Indeed. Now the other puzzle is, what do we do with them? Mm. They are indebted, first of all, they have families to look after. Mm. Do they actually even have money mm. uh, to load data bundles uh, for them to do continuity? So there is a mix there. And that also sought alternative sources of livelihood. Some of them, some 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 of them chapati making. absolutely. Some of them will never come back. So how do you get that person from a, a chapati making mechanism or expedition <laughs> all the way to a class <laughs> where they have to teach science? Now that, that's really something that needs realigning. Mm. And I think it's much more that we have to do than basically preparing classrooms, mm. up, uh, complying uh, to the mm. SOPs, it's actually more than that. Mm. So, so, so it's, it's a big task mm. and that requires a strategy and proper mm. organization within the institution. Mm. We have to sit and talk, we have to set up committees, mm. we have to get experts on board to address this issue. Mm. You may deal with the students, mm. prepare the classes, mm. uh, comply with the SOPs, but there are bigger issues, mental indeed. health issues, uh, psychological uh, indeed issues. Indeed, Dr. Mohamed in Pesami, he go, yes. and of course, that actually conversation invokes the $64,000 question that has been on the lips of the viewer one too many times. Do we, we have some two months, that is November and December. Mm -hmm. Is it enough time to prepare for a full reopening where you do have to realign the teachers, the learners, ensure expansion of these structures to ensure adherence to the social uh, standard operating procedures is two months enough time to ensure that all these factors are put into play to ensure a mm. safe reopening. I think they are actually they are enough because let's let's be actually fair. And keep in mind we've taken two months to only vaccinate 550,000. Absolutely, but but the the, fa the fact is mm. that uh, we've been in lockdown since 2020 with you know some short openings. Yes, doctor. Okay, mm. and and uh, before we reopened even for those shorter periods. Mm. There was, uh, there was compliance inspection. So the Ministry of Education and Sports mm. actually set up teams. They went to institutions mm. and we were allowed to open. Mm. And we've actually had some lessons mm. uh, all through. So it's not like we, we are starting from zero. Indeed. So, so my hope is that uh, institutions can actually prepare mm. uh, to get things done to understand that uh, COVID is here and we'll have to stay with. Now the issue Don't be of silent when there is a case, report absolute, it. Absolutely, so realigning the curriculum, and mm. I've read uh, from uh, different sources, mm. uh, they, they are also thinking about realigning curricula for the lower level uh, levels of education. Indeed. That will have an impact mm. on the curricula we deliver mm. at the university level. Indeed. And so we have to talk together, we have to bring everybody mm. on board, all the stakeholders, mm. and prepare ourselves. What shouldn't happen is continuous closure Indeed. because that will have a lasting negative Well, uh, of course, UNICEF is saying that uh, Uganda has closed schools longer than any other jurisdiction in the whole world. What's your comment on that? And oh, will yes. that actually go a long way in actually mm -hmm. pushing us back as far as education mm -hmm. is concerned? You do have some learners within Koboko, Moyo, and many of the jurisdictions within the West now right. who have forgotten to count one to ten. 
Right. Uh, I mean, the, the, the data is available mm. by UNICEF, and we've been ranked, you know, with some countries like uh, Bolivia, mm. Nepal, and others, okay, in mm. terms of uh, the duration we have locked down. Mm. But that should also be matched with, the, 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 you know, the, the losses of mm. life. I mm. think uh, there was 3, wisdom. 3,100. Yeah, absolutely, okay. yes. The, there's a great wisdom in protecting the lives of the kids. So the lockdown was yes. worth it to protect it lives. It was worth That That I cannot even, I mean, I, I'm, on. I'm on that mm. side of supporting mm. uh, the closure. However, we can't hide in the closure mm. by not putting up measures that will address the gap created mm. by that closure. Mm -hmm. Because the, the government has to invest mm. in infrastructure technology and others. Mm. We have to, like like you actually highlighted, mm. uh, the, the, the schools are indebted and a big chunk of the providers are private, private sector. Mm. And so we need some interventions, the measures that will come on board. Co what COVID has done mm. now is it has leveled everybody. However, the gap is where you find public institutions mm. have continued to earn a salary, they mm. are paid, everything, mm. okay? Whereas we are all closed. Mm. In the private sector, Okay, we are struggling. Mm. So we are saying we should come on the same table. And of course, Dr. Mohammed, that is a recipe for disaster because according to the research being done by Morning at NTV, we do know that uh, most of the education sectors within mm. this country are run by private proprietors or right. institutions. Right. 61% of the primary schools are run privately, 58% of these uh, secondary schools are run privately. The more than 40 university mm. and tertiary institutions here in the country mm. are actually run privately. So don't you think we do have a huge problem ahead of the reopening that the majority mm. of the schools mm. that are actually going to be absorbing the learners are actually indebted as a result of loans and could be under lock and key even when we say we should reopen schools tomorrow? I mean, it, it's really like, uh, let's make a reflection. If there were natural disasters, if there were natural disasters, and, and those disasters mm. caused a lockdown, mm. what would you do? Mm. For example, mm. if, if a country got such, I mean, we've seen it uh, previously. Mm. So, so the, the whole idea is for government to realize that this is, education is a basic right. And therefore, the providers, whereas some were driven by profit, mm. others were actually mm. non-profit, it's actually a good thing for mm. the state. Mm. And, and for us in the Uganda Vice Chancellor's Forum, we are so happy because we combine both public and private. Mm. And so we talk, we meet in the ministry, we, we discuss, we work with the National Council for Higher Education, and this is something. But in terms of funding, mm. I think this is where the mm. state has to come on board. And of course, many of the teachers have vacated the profession. Should we be talking about actually recruiting more and training more of these teachers to actually take on that void that was created? It's going to be it's massive. Mm. We have got to do some kind of uh, needs assessment. Mm. We have to find a, we'll do a gap analysis. Mm. Uh, many of the, the teachers, especially for the lower levels, okay, have found a, a scenario where right. they've, they've engaged in different activities, mm. economic activities, mm. uh, and the same applies to the university lecturers okay. and other stuff. And so I think this, the whole of this mix requires co a concerted effort mm. and focus, but with the support of the state in order to revamp education, mm. but remain complying uh, to the SOPs. Amazing insights right here on Morning at NTV, courtesy of the Vice Chancellor, Kampala International University, Dr. Mohamed Mpeza Mihigo. Thank you very much for having made Thank the you. time to speak to us. Thank I love you. Kampala International University. Thank you, you so much. Thank 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 you so much for coming through. Yeah, it's a pleasure. All right. You're still watching Morning at NTV. Well, this is a very non partisan um, uh, platform. We do not care if you're from the FDC, UPC, Gemma. Uh, NRM who want to talk to you to talk about how use we, we can resuscitate this economy to get back to normalcy. How best can we expedite standard operating procedures so that when we resume classes, we don't go back to the Ford being uh, manned by COVID-19. Let's take a breather, return shortly with more information right here on Morning at NTV.